now it's my great, great pleasure to um, go to the next part of the program. And this is our keynote um, lecture. So our keynote speaker today is Deborah Heiser, who is the founder and CEO of the Mentor Project, founder of IMH. She is an applied developmental psychologist, a TEDx speaker, a Psychology Today contributor, a researcher, author, coach, consultant, founder and CEO of the Mentor Project, and an adjunct professor in psychology at the department of SUNY at, um, in the psychology department of SUNY at Old Westbury. She will talk about lateral mentoring in a hierarchical environment, mentoring at every stage in your career, which fits also very well with our new office for senior faculty transition. So Debbie, the microphone, the virtual microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Miriam. And thank you for having me here today. It's a real pleasure and an honor. And I'm really uh, thankful in particular to Anne Levy and to Miriam for inviting me today. So I'm gonna, I'm sharing my screen. I'll just make sure I can pull up the talk just a moment. Here we are. Just bear with me as I get to the, all right. Steve is a guy similar to so many of us and he works in an office and he has a boss and his boss has presented him with an impossible task. And it's been presented with an impossible time frame to complete it. So Al comes to Steve and he says, Steve, how's the project coming? And Steve says, don't worry, Al, I've got it. I, I'll take care of it, don't worry. Al comes back a couple of days later, Steve, how's the project going? And Steve says, don't worry about it. When Al leaves though, Steve's a puddle inside. He really doesn't have it. Steve keeps hitting a wall. He doesn't quite know how to navigate past this one particular point that he keeps getting to. So Al comes back one more time and he says, listen, Steve, this is a critical project. The company needs this to launch. We have to have this happen. And it has to happen within the next three weeks or we're gonna, everything is lost. So the pressure is really put on Steve at this point. And so Steve says, listen, I've got it, Al. Steve then calls his friend, Steve, and says, Steve, I can't do this project. It's impossible. The task is just too hard. What do you, what do you think I should do? And Steve says, well, I can help you. And Steve says, you know what? You do know that kind of, um, that kind of engineering that's needed that is just the kind that I don't know. Do you mind coming and helping? And Steve says, of course not, I'll be right over after work, don't worry. So he comes over and it turns out that he's able to fill in the gap that Steve had where he just wasn't able to finish it. He was hitting a wall and they worked late into the night. And the next morning when Steve came into work bleary eyed, Al said, Steve, you made some progress here. What happened? And Steve said, oh, I told you I had it, it's fine. So the next night, Steve comes back and the two Steves work together all through the night and they continue this and finish the project in record time, well before the impossible date uh, that they were supposed to, that Steve was supposed to achieve it. And this actually turned out to be a breakout moment. The boss is Al Alcorn. And I heard the story directly from Al, although it is one that is well known. Al's uh, employee was Steve Jobs. This was an early job for him. And the Steve that he called upon was Steve Wozniak. This is long before the Apple computer. So in this case, Steve and Steve engaged in lateral mentoring. Steve called his friend and said, hey, I know you know this kind of engineering that I don't know. Can you teach it to me at night so I can learn how to do this and get my job done and keep my job? Now, chances are you're doing this already all the time and you don't even know it. So when I spoke with Al, 
he didn't think of it as lateral mentoring. He initially said, oh, well, Steve Jobs was just lazy and wasn't doing his job. And Steve Wozniak came in kind of thinking of it as the Tom Sawyer painting the fence that Steve has had wrangled his friend into doing the work. In fact, that's not what it was. This is lateral mentoring. This is what people engage in all the time. And it really takes a small action and makes it into a big impact. Lateral mentoring is a different kind of mentoring. It's not hierarchical. And this is why we often engage in this and don't even know it because we're engaging with people that we know. We're engaging with people who are in our environment all the time. So if you look to your left and you look to your right, you may be looking at somebody that you've laterally mentored already. So I'd like you just to take a moment to think about anyone that you might have engaged in in a lateral mentoring way. Just a moment, because I, I have a feeling that you've done it maybe even today and you don't realize it. You can put it in the chat. You can just think it to yourself, but try to take just a moment to think of anyone you might've engaged in laterally, lateral mentoring with. So, when was the last time you had a curbside consult, a formal consult, grand rounds? These are all often leading to lateral mentorship. These are actually engaging in that in a lot of cases where you're seeking a consultation from somebody that you know who isn't your boss. You're saying, hey, I have a case. Can you give me some, can you talk to me about that? Can you give me some advice? The issue here is that when we don't, acknowledge that we're engaged in lateral mentoring or in a form of a, an act that could lead to high impact, it gets lost at the moment. It doesn't go as far as it possibly could. As soon as we know what we're doing and acknowledge it, we can be more informed in taking that small act to an even higher impact into where it can go. So there are four key components to lateral mentoring. And I really like to highlight this slide um, because it's like a recipe. If it's missing one ingredient, it's like brownies missing sugar. It'll look like brownies, but it sure won't taste like brownies. So in this case, we need all four of these to exist to make it an actual true lateral mentoring experience. And the first one here is generativity. Generativity is being, it, it's generating something. It's extending yourself out to create a reflection of you. It's aiming to be of use and it's caring and nurturing. It's giving away your skills and expertise without expecting something in return. And you probably know someone who is generative. It may even be you. But think about anybody in your life that you know of. And I heard one recipient of an award actually mention someone who is generative, her mom uh, in her life. So this is somebody who could be very close to you, but it could be a colleague. Someone who writes prolifically about this, who I consider to be the demigod of generativity is Dan McAdams. And in the, uh, I sent a link in this talk with a video clip of him and some of his work, but his mentor when he was at Harvard was um, David McClelland and working with motivation, which then led to him writing uh, prolifically about generativity. But this is a concept that is really caring for others without expecting something in return. And we often mistake generativity with reciprocity and generosity. And I just wanna break this down a little bit because generativity is what mentoring is. It's putting your expertise out to others in a nurturing and caring way. Now, generativity isn't just mentoring, it can also be volunteering and philanthropy, but we're talking about mentoring. Um, and that's generativity is in fact mentoring. What mentoring isn't is reciprocity. Reciprocity is a tit for tat. I'll do this for you, you do this for me. This is what we talk about when we say collaboration. This is the difference. 
One is extending beyond yourself and one is um, a tit for a tat. It's just being reciprocal. It stops there. And generosity is dialing it back one more. It's a kindness or it's an act involving um, generating something, but it doesn't involve generating it beyond the act. If you get an extra scoop of ice cream when you go to the ice cream store, that's generous. That's someone giving you a generous helping of something. It's a kindness, but it doesn't go beyond that. And that's where it's not mentoring. So the next one is intrinsic motivation. Hold on. And this motivation comes from within. It's not from pay, praise, awards, or rewards. So in the case of Steve Wozniak coming to help his friend, Steve Jobs, he, no one even knew he came and helped. He came in the night. His friend called him and he said, I'll come, I'll help you. No one gave him any pay for it. He was never paid for that work. No one praised him because no one knew he did it. And he didn't get anything else. He did it because he was intrinsically motivated to do it. He loved doing programming. This was a problem he wanted to solve and it was involving his friend. So this is a case of intrinsic motivation. And meaningful connection. This is not reciprocal and it's not superficial. It's deeper and it's caring in both directions. So if I go back to Steve and Steve, this is somebody wanting to help somebody they care about and they, they're willing to go and do it. And mentors do this. They, they care for their mentee. They care for the person that they're working with. And laterally, it, it happens all the time. It's someone setting out and caring for the person that they're, that they're with. And finally, trust. Breakout never would have happened if Steve didn't have someone to trust. Steve didn't trust uh, showing his vulnerabilities to Al. He kept saying, I've got it, Al, I've got it. He never once said, hey, Al, I'm hitting a wall, I can't do it. He did trust his friend. He did trust Steve. And it's much easier to show our vulnerabilities to someone laterally than it is to someone who's above us hierarchically. And this is the one component that often keeps something from becoming lateral mentoring to just being somebody hits a wall and that idea ends. So by incorporating trust into it and making it easier to access that trust by moving to someone laterally, that takes the awkwardness away. It takes away any of the issues that we often have with thinking, I don't wanna show the person above me that I don't know it or that I'm not as good at it. I have imposter syndrome, on and on. This component is really key usually. Now I show you this slide because I'm an applied developmental psychologist. I look at the lifespan and I look at what we have to look at in our trajectory. And as an aging specialist, this is what most people see. Most people see our physical ability and they think of our life as being a, a, a steep incline in our physical ability and then a slow steady decline as we age. And this is scary to people. It, it isn't something that people look forward to, um, but this is generally the way that people think about our lives and what we have to look forward to. But this is really what drives us. It's our emotional growth, which is the same uh, as looking at our physical growth. Everything that we have, our milestones that we have are things that like, um, like being able to care for others. All of these milestones that we hit that are emotional in our lives, they just continue to develop and get as we go on and on, they never decline. And this is what we have to look forward to. And when I talk about mentoring, it is on the emotional growth trajectory, not the physical growth trajectory. And it continues to grow and develop and, and help us to have better emotional uh, growth as we get older. So mentoring really, uh, when I think about it and think about generativity, I always go right back to Erickson. Um, we are built to give back just like walking, just like talking, just like any physical milestone. And it's a milestone we should hit at about 50. So this is a point when we are thinking, hey, I've checked the boxes. I have done what I'm supposed to do, now what? 
Now what do I do? And this is when most people say, I'm going to give back now. I have the, I have the bandwidth now. I'm an expert in what I do. I can start to give back now. Now, if you haven't, we should talk. I called, I really call the people who haven't quite hit that milestone, the Ebenezer effect. Um, you're not going to see that in a textbook. That's something I've coined um, and made up. But we don't have to be a Scrooge. We don't have to live a life des destined uh, to misery. We can change at any age. Unlike physical milestones, our emotional milestones, are, we can hit them at uh, various ages. So if we don't hit it right on time, we can at a later age. And Scrooge is an example of that. So um, Ebenezer Scrooge, if you've watched the movies, um, Scrooge uh, or read Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, the character Scrooge is someone who was a self-made man. He checked all the boxes. He was wealthy. He lived in a mansion. He had servants taking care of all of his needs. He really on paper looked great, but he was miserly with his emotions and he was miserly with his possessions. And it wasn't until he became generative and gave back to others that he experienced joy. And this is exactly how it happens with, with all of us. This is how it happens. Once we hit that, we've, we're there and we hit that stage. So when we think of mentoring, and I've asked so many people, so what are the benefits to being a mentor? Most people that say, oh, I don't know. I've never thought of the mentor. We all think of the mentee and how can the mentee benefit? You know, we open doors for them. It can mean a whole new uh, world that can open up a new job. It can mean advancement. It can mean all kinds of great things. But let's think about the mentor now, because mentees are gonna become mentors and a lot of people are mentoring, they don't even know it. And some people may say, I would like to mentor. Well, the benefits often outweigh the benefits that a mentee receives. Things like legacy. This is a form of immortality. As we give out our skills and our values and our expertise to the next generation, a little piece of us goes with that person that takes it and they move on with it and do more with it. It doesn't end with us. What we have gets put out into the world in a form of a legacy. So think to yourself, what would you like your legacy to be? And who would you like to carry that legacy? This is something we have control over as mentors. This is something that we can do that actively with control and that gives us a really great sense of um, emotional well-being to have that. Another is productivity. This is something that uh, people in getting ready to retire will think, well, how can I be productive? Well, mentorship offers that before retirement or afterwards. Um, when we are productive, we feel like we matter, like we have reason to be what we work so hard to do and to, um, to get expertise in actually matters. So productivity is very important and mentors are productive. And the next is purpose. So if we feel we have purpose, we're able to feel that all of those boxes that we're checking and have checked off mean something. And as we watch or guide someone else, whether laterally or hierarchically as a mentor, we're able to see that purpose and see what we did and brought out as being something that matters. Connectedness with the larger community in the world is also very important. When I talked about Scrooge, he lived in a silo, was successful on paper and within box checks, but he wasn't connected with the larger community in the world. He was very self-involved. And by connecting with people outside of ourselves, whether that's a very small community or a very wide community, it doesn't matter. It's connecting with the world so we can see ourselves as a person in the world and that we can make a difference in the world and that we matter in the world and that people need us. This is all stuff that we emotionally need. And the deep, meaningful relationships, this has been studied. This is part of the Harvard Longitudinal Study, 
uh, Laura Carstensen's work with Stanford, there's countless studies that look at why and how deep meaningful relationships lead to better physical and emotional outcomes. And mentors have deep mentor meaningful relationships. They care about their mentees. Anyone in here who is a mentor will say that they care about their mentees. The person that I have um, known for quite a while now, Bill Cheswick, he is known as the father of the one of the fathers of the firewall. Uh, we would not be communicating right now on Zoom if it were not for him. His internet security work that he did with Bell Labs um, was work that really changed the world. And um, he talked to me years ago about um, how Bell Labs worked. It was just a, a lateral mentorship candy store. It was people engaging strictly in lateral mentorship in order to make small ideas become world-changing impacts. And so he talks about his time at Bell Labs and how lateral mentoring worked for him. And just so you know, in the background of his video that you're gonna see, it is a the internet uh, map, the, the very, one of the very first ones. You can see some of that in like museums and um, other places. He, you probably have stuff in your pocket that he's patented, so. Take a listen to Bill. I'm a science guy from the Sputnik era, and Bell Labs was the shining city on the hill. Bell Labs was the research arm of at and It was a, a top world-class research institution, the source of many inventions that you've heard of. Your pocket has stuff in it that was invented at Bell Labs. It was an amazing resource. First of all, everyone was a member of technical staff, MTS. Uh, we, many, many people were PhDs, but we didn't call each other doctors. We were all sort of uh, working together, but you know, the guy down the hall invented something and the next guy next to him invented something else. And if you needed help, or if you had a problem, the, the environment was very open to just dropping by someone's office and saying, I have a problem with statistics, can you help me? And the answer is usually, yeah, let's see what you got. I found I was coming up with some new ideas. When I started at the labs in 1987, I took over the uh, firewall that uh, Dave Prezado had built and uh, I started improving it. And uh, I started writing papers on it and so on. And that led to the need for writing a book on firewalls because this was all new. So I went to Steve Bellavin, who had taught me a lot about TCP IP, the basic networking of the internet. Mm -hmm. And he agreed and we co-authored a book, which was the first book on firewalls. And uh, that really, writing important books was one of the things they liked having happen at, at Bell Labs. And this certainly was one. It sold over 100,000 copies. You know, there, there's a whole bunch of different ideas. And uh, Bell Labs is just a frothing mixture of people doing stuff, eating lunch with different people and, and trading ideas, the weekly show and tell when you learn what people were doing. So here we go. Oh, I don't want it to play again. Just a minute. It's not advancing. There we go. Okay, so the next person I'd like to um, have you listen to is Bruce Wiley. Maybe you know, uh, know him. He's a Harvard trained physician who um, is also a computer modeler. He has more than $40 million in NIH grants. And he also is a science writer for Forbes with more than 70 million views of his articles. So um, he, is a prolific lateral mentor. I've seen it in action. And so I hope that you'll enjoy I listening to- I am Bruce Y. Lee. Uh, I usually mention the Y because rumor has it that someone else was named Bruce Lee at some point. Um, but I'm Bruce Wiley. I'm a professor of health policy and management at uh, City University of New York. I'm also executive director of the Center for Advanced Technology and Communications and Health, which is uh, abbreviated as CATCH. Um, I'm also a writer and journalist. I cover health, uh, healthcare and medicine for Forbes. Um, and I've also written for a number of other different outlets and written several books. 
so different things like that. Always enjoyed mentoring. I mean, you know, academically in many different areas. So uh, because I think you have a real opportunity to help people. One of the things that all of you uh, probably realize, you know, being in the health field, uh, you cover a lot of different areas that are highly relevant to many of your friends or highly relevant to people that you interact with outside work. Uh, so, you know, that can range from anything like nutrition to things like COVID-19 during the pandemic. So one of the things that I found, for instance, throughout the entire pandemic, since I've worked in the area of, uh, you know, infectious diseases and pandemic preparedness and response for like the past 15 years or so, people had a lot of different questions about what was going on. So I found myself in many situations where I would be talking with people, uh, in some cases within the medical field, but also in many cases, in many other, you know, across many other different disciplines. So people who are like astrophysicists or people who are engineers or people who are professional comedians or people who are psychologists, uh, lawyers, very distinguished people who are like leaders in their field, but they wanted to learn more about COVID-19. I found that to be very fulfilling to have an opportunity to do this. So I would urge that, you know, don't view lateral mentoring as something that you just kind of do it as part of your job description, or you don't just do it and you drop it when you walk out the door uh, and then you go into your social life or go into your family life. It's a so there are action items that we have that we can employ in terms of getting lateral mentoring into our lives. Both Bill and Bruce are prolific lateral mentors um, and the work environments that they have created um, involve that. Some of the key action items are identify, assess and create. These are really pretty easy. So if you ask yourself, just this simple question, is there someone I can help? This is the first step to it. Also ask yourself, is there someone who can help me? We often don't ask ourselves both of those, but it's important that we do that because lateral mentoring is getting and taking. It's really um, working um, in, from side to side. And once you identify potential mentoring opportunities, and it can be anyone, from any place, chances are your career will advance. And one example I have of this that I was able to see unfold was an EDD in education and a PhD in linguistics walked into a meeting together. This was right after the pandemic started and they were both saying, oh my goodness, I don't know how I'm gonna teach, right? You know, because I am now on Zoom and this is an issue for me. Well. It turned out that they were able to utilize their way of speaking and pro, uh, projecting uh, with regard to linguist, linguistics and the words to use and the way in which to use them into the education component that the EDD in education needed. That resulted in an article in Nature and countless um, educational tools that both of them were able to use and get out into the public in a very short amount of time. So that just came from identifying someone in a meeting they had never met before and probably wouldn't have um, had any contact with prior to or after. The next is assessing. So we need to be able to assess the talents, expertise, and skills of others. Where do they have strengths that can support our weaknesses? and vice versa. So if we're identifying individuals and then we're assessing strengths and weaknesses, this is some, something that helps us to call upon them when we need it, when we need something. So this was the case of Steve and Steve. Steve had already long ago identified Steve Wozniak as someone that he knew, but it wasn't until he re recognized that he had already assessed that he had a talent and an expertise in an area that was different from him. And that's what led to them connecting and really making the um, small act turn into a big impact. A, an example that just happened um, in 2020 was um, the result of work that was done by um, Cristiano Galbiati. 
while the world was watching Italy um, singing from their balconies and they were all in their uh, quarantine. Cristiano was visiting his relatives who were physicians in Italy. And as a Princeton physicist, he said, how can I help? And he took that hopeless feeling and he identified a friend of his who is Art McDonald, the 2015 Nobel laureate in physics. And he said, hey, Art, I know you have skill in this area. Can you help me out? And Art said, yeah, I'll help you out. So Cristiano said, I know how to build this, but I need help to get manufacturing and I need help in some of the engineering. So Art and he identified 150 people in nine countries around the world to help them with this. And within six weeks, they built a ventilator that was able to be used and got FDA approval and international approval to be used around the world. And that was sent out to countries and tens of thousands of these reached people um, in critical need. And that was simply based on Cristiano reaching out to someone that he knew who he had identified and then they assessed the talents of others and then they created it. And the next slide is talking about creating. And this is where once you identify and assess a potential mentor, you can create endless opportunities. You don't have to even know them. In the case of the MVM, those were virtual strangers that had never met and they all came on board to help. So you can advance your passions or your career. And you can do this for awards, grants, breakthrough opportunities like the MVM or like breakout. It can be anything. It can be a passion of yours outside. Maybe you want to write. Whatever it is that you have, the three things that you can do is identify, assess, and then create. And this is easy in terms of taking action. There are formal mentoring programs already at MGH. They're really well run and they work. There are some that work really well in terms of being, um, being moved into something that can work for lateral mentorship. And some of those are things like bringing experts together from different disciplines to lunches, to retreats and to conferences. And these are the kinds of places where in, I've seen this happen. I worked with um, the Iowa judicial system. One of the federal, one of the district court judges said to me, I, what do you do if you're a judge and you don't know the answer? Well, it's very difficult. It's a hard position to be in. Who do you ask? Um, it's awkward. And you run the risk of people thinking that you don't know what you need to know to be a judge to make good decisions. So what, what, what we were able to do was he was able to implement a um, informal, uh, it was called a formal program, but they were lunches so that the judges were able to reach out and talk to judges next to each other and say, hey, do you, do you know how I could handle this case? Have you seen that? Have you worked on something like that? Do you have any advice for me? And that formal, in, formal situation turned into informal mentoring that led to chats, lists, things that are on WhatsApp, Slack, Discord, and other clubs that can be implemented very easily for no money. And they're really, really impactful. So I have a hunch that everyone here is already mentoring and in ways that you probably don't know. But as soon as you're able to translate that into that at those actions that you're doing regularly, you'll be able to take the action and bring those to make really high impact for things that you're already enjoying and doing already. So I want to thank you for allowing me to talk to you today about lateral mentorship. And I'm always happy to engage with anyone in lateral mentoring. Um, you can reach me at The Mentor Project, um, LinkedIn, or Psychology Today. And thank you again for allowing me to present today.
Thank you so much, Debbie. This was just um, really eye-opening for me. And I want to be more mindful of this lateral mentorship because as you said, it really happens at every stage. And um, I would like, if you have questions in the audience, um, raise your virtual hand or put it in the chat. I have a question for you. I was really impressed and intrigued by the guy from Bell Labs and the atmosphere was so collegial. There was no hierarchy. And in academia, you have, there is, they have your lab leaders, people are very protective of their data, and, and often they want, don't want to share and maybe afraid someone else is going to take credit. So how do you create an atmosphere of collaboration? Yes, yeah, someone just said, how is lateral mentorship different from collaboration? Um, can you say a few words about that? Sure. Well, I'll start with how um, lateral mentorship is different from collaboration. Collaboration is often um, reciprocal. Mm -hmm. So you're helping somebody and then you're expecting something in return. You are, you have a role in this. I have a role in this. It's very distinct and it doesn't go anywhere after that. So that's what collaboration is. Lateral mentorship usually leads to something that continues on and on. So when you were asking about, about Bell Labs, that was a matter of you know, when he worked with Steve Bellavin, that was decades that they've been working together. It didn't end with one interaction. So that's the difference. If you're going to look for collaboration, continue to do that, that's great. But it's only if it's gonna to lead to something bigger. And that's when, if you identify and assess, you're gonna be looking for someone that you're gonna be able to have some kind of a meaningful connection with, not just a, a one-time only collaborative relationship with. And, um, Right. Oh, Larry. Yeah, there is a question from Anand. Hi, Anand, joining from Wisconsin. Get a shout out, one of my former colleagues. Can ah. you comment on going beyond lateral mentorship to lateral sponsorship? That's it. Well, that it's exact, exactly the same. So, you know, if you have a mentor or a sponsor, you can do that across um, at any level. So I would say that I engage in lateral sponsorship. I help and I sponsor so many people to try to get awards or to try to get things or do things. And that is something that I get great when they get it. I'm so thrilled. And I think that everybody else is too. That is the same thing, engaging in lateral um, sponsorship and, and lateral mentorship. You're not, I'm not looking for them to then say, oh, I'll nominate you for something next. Yeah. It really just feels like I see an opportunity for you I'm going to, I'm going to put that out there for you. And a lot of times, you know, you asked about how this could be in a hierarchical environment. A lot of people are in hierarchical environments. That's the corporate world. That's, that's medicine. What, what I have seen work the best is when we look to the left and we look to the right. And that's where we look to our mentorship, because when we're looking to the left and to the right, we, we, take away all of those walls that we put up that make it awkward for us to be vulnerable, to, you know, to say, you know, all right, I trust my friend to the left or to the right, who is at the same level as me. I'll tell them, I don't know, I don't know something or I need help, but I may not tell somebody two levels above me because then they're going to remember that. And maybe I'm not going to get promoted. Um, so that's where small groups and I, I see this all the time and I even have this myself, small WhatsApp groups of people that I feel like I can trust. We will sponsor each other for things. We will help each other with grants. We will help each other with whatever we're doing. And those become really powerful, emotional, um, wonderful experiences for people. So you can expand that out. You can have multiple pods of them that you, that you have. And you can also say to people, hey, I would really like to meet somebody in this field or in this area or three departments down. Can I be introduced to that person because you've identified that there might be something there. That's how you can move away from hierarchical. And because you're in hierarchical mentoring doesn't mean you can't also do lateral mentoring. Yeah. They should both be done all the time. So that's right. Is that a little bit like what we're doing, our peer mentoring groups with our, we have the senior women, we're like a group of 10, 20, and we nominate each other for awards. Yeah. We, um, exactly. we meet, we run ideas by us. If someone wants to join a committee, they ask the others, what do you think? And mm -hmm. you're doing it. And you, yes. And peer to peer is similar to that. 
you know, Colgate Palmolive um, also has a women's network where they do a lot of that. And it's very collegial. And what they found is that people advance much more rapidly when you're involved in lateral mentoring because there isn't any competition with someone that you're working laterally with. You're, if you're at a lateral position and they're in a different department, you're not worried about missing out on something. So you can engage in much more helpful interactions with those individuals when you're on sort of equal footing. Great, thank you. Other question, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I'm so interested in different types of mentoring. So lateral mentoring, I'm gonna add that. Anyone else in the audience, you can just unmute yourself. We are, um, or raise your virtual hand. I, I will say also, it's very hard to wrap your head around lateral mentoring and how it's different from generosity, reciprocity, collaboration, all of these things that are out there. The difference is that if we're adding in the components that we that I mentioned um, earlier with the intrinsic motivation, the um, trust, these are the sorts of things that if you're finding yourself that you're already motivated to do something, uh, that and you already like someone or you trust someone or you feel these kinds of things, you're going to be more likely to engage in lateral mentorship and you're not, you're not going to be doing that in a, in, in a long-term way if you're just collaborating yeah. or you're um, just doing a nice act for someone. We all do nice acts for people and that's good. Don't stop doing that. But um it's, it's a different thing. And, and also the lateral mentoring does uh, really fit in with longer term emotional um, uh, well-being that is talked about by some of the research. Great. I can totally see that. And I would like to encourage everyone. We have the mentoring group for women, but I encourage everyone, the postdocs, the grad student, find your pods, find your smaller groups and I, I have found it extremely gratifying and valuable and it really opened my, up my mind. And I, yeah, Sue is one of our <laughs> members of the- one, one other thing to say that you just mentioned with, when mentioned with your pod, a person can be a lateral mentor and three levels higher hierarchically than someone else in that pod that you're talking about, but it's still lateral. As long as they're not their boss or someone that mm -hmm. has um, some kind of influence over their work trajectory, then it's lateral. So, you know, when I speak with, you know, I, I work with say Bob, or I work with Bill, who's, uh, or I work with um, Bill and I work with Bob, who's like the, he's the 2020 inventor of the year. And he did, he uh, patented how we use credit cards on the internet, stuff like that. We are lateral mentors. I, my brain isn't on his level. <laughs> but we can still lateral mentor um, because we are so different in where we are that we can still work together to make things happen. And um, that collaboration that started as a collaboration turned into lateral mentoring. That was an example that formed the mentor project. Bill, uh, Bob and I came together to do that. And we're, we have completely disparate backgrounds, but it formed a nonprofit. Um, because we came together. And Can you say a few words about the mentor project? We didn't really talk about it and yeah. you didn't talk about it in your, in your talk, but. So the mentor project is really built out of lateral mentoring. We look at mentoring from the perspective of the mentor. So we're mentor focused. Mm -hmm. So we bring some of the world experts on various topics. We bring in astronauts, astrophysicists, inventors, lawyers, it's really STEAM business law um, and um, uh, art that we bring into um, K through university around the world. So we've been able to reach about 100,000 so far. Um, we've been around since about 2019 that we've been an actual nonprofit. And what we do a little bit differently to make sure that we're always engaging in the lateral mentoring is once a week, we have a Zoom luncheon where one person presents and we all talk and we all, each one of those has led to other nonprofits have led to, um, you know, when you get people who are action oriented together and they lateral mentor, it's led to two books, it's led to um, two patents, it's led to, I mean, it's really kind of cool. Um, so we're very 
we know that if we engage the mentors, um, that the mentees will follow. And so our mentees have already patented, they've already, um, you know, accomplished podcasts, all kinds of things, whatever they've been looking to do. And so we've, been, we've had a lot of success so far, but it's really based on just a passion project that started from people saying, I wanna give back. Um, Bill and Bob said, you know, we're at a certain level where we're not around kids anymore. We're retired. And um, if we'll look like weirdos, if we go approach children and say, hi, I'd like to mentor you in quantum <laughs> mechanics. And um, so I said, yeah, you probably would, don't do that. So let's start the mentor project. And that's how it started. Um, and wow. in fact, it's just a lot of fun, which is what lateral mentoring is. Amazing, very amazing. Are there any other comments from here, the audience, any questions? I just want to say that listening to Debbie, it made me realize that in the case of the some of our awardees, especially the more senior ones, that what happens as mentors get more and more experienced and accomplished is that their goal becomes to, to move their mentee to a situation where the two of them can have lateral mentoring and that it's not hierarchical anymore in any way, shape or form. And I think that's such a beautiful way to give back. That's such a good point, Anne. You're so right. And think of all of think think to yourself. You've probably already engaged in that. Um, for example, I'm I'm still in touch with my college and my graduate school mentors. And now my mentor from graduate school and I collab. You know, we we work on projects together. Um, I would, I would say we don't really lateral mentor yet. We, we collaborate more. It's a one-off here and there, but that is true. You wanna see your mentee become your equal at some point. Um, and that is often the goal because then you get to have a different relationship, um, which is really even more meaningful. Yeah, great, great comment and others speak <laughs> now <laughs> or Forever hold your peace. You know? Well, if there are no more comments, I would like to congratulate all of our winners today and the nominees. It was an exceptional group of people. And Debbie, thank you so much. You really opened my mind on other types of mentoring. And I will definitely take this into account when we design new mentorship initiatives at the CFD. Thank you. And congratulations to everyone. It was a real pleasure. And I have to say, it was really exciting to see everyone uh, being presented as winners. So thank you for well, having me today. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, Brenda, can we save the chat? And because there are so many nice comments on congratulations, so we can give it to our awardees. Yes, and Debbie, thank you again. I hope we will see you again here. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>